Welcome to Camp Podcast Special Edition, Lost to Time. I am pianist Migo, and I serve as president of the Contemporary Art Music Project, or CAMP. CAMP is an organization that promotes innovative art music and collaborates with composers and performing artists. One of many activities we do is our podcast series. Our hosts explore a wide range of topics from marginalized composers in music history to current collaborations. Please make sure you are subscribed to Camp Podcast. Tonight, I am your host, and I am thrilled to talk with our podcast Lost to Time hosts Han Hichin and Joshua Mallard. Lost to Time explored marginalized composers throughout the Western music history. Han and Josh introduced many lesser known composers to our listeners. It has been truly educational and enlightening. Sadly, we are saying a farewell to the series. Um, tonight, we'll talk about all behind stories about creating and producing episodes of Lost to Time. Also, Han and Josh are wonderful composers um, who studied at the University of South Florida and Penn State University. <clears throat> We'll listen to their compositions at the end of the uh, show. So <clears throat> stay tuned with us. Hi, Josh and Han. Thank you so much for being here with me. Glad Thank to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, I'm very sad the series came, um, will come to an end. We will have uh, uh, the final episode. Um, and uh, it has been so great, uh, and it taught me so many, uh, so many things uh, about. Uh, of course, I got to know uh, different composers and their their work. Listen to um, all this wonderful music that we did not know before. So, I want to start with a question um, about you know your motivation that how. Um, it became to uh, start this project um, and what was your motivation? Um, I could start with this one, Josh, if you'd like. Sure. So something that for me was important was just the fact that going through um, music education, going through a degree in music at the university level, I noticed that in various classes we were taking that were required by um, the university for our degree did not include, well, each of these classes included repertoire that would be relevant to whatever the class is. So if it's music history of the Baroque era or music theory, I don't know, 20th century analysis or anything like that, a lot of the music we were studying was not by music who was anyone who is not a white man um usually straight usually straight white men usually dead white men and it was something that um really troubled me and I remember at one point I had the opportunity to kind of voice this concern um and not everyone was as receptive using um the fact not the fact but this idea that oh well we would have to go out of our way to find whole new replacements of our repertoire just to be um, inclusive. And this was an issue during my undergrad, as early as my undergrad, that I noticed this problem of people saying, oh, well, I don't know anyone, so I'm not going to bother to change my curriculum and make it better and more inclusive. And I thought, well, that's, that's kind of ridiculous. I don't think that's true. And so that got me really interested in, while I am interested in learning of these composers in the classes I had to take. I was also interested in learning of other composers who maybe are not getting the recognition, the spotlight that these other composers are receiving. Yeah, that's basically that for me. Josh, do you have anything you would like yeah, to add? Yeah, I think I can add to that. Um, I think what really stands out to me is like the timing, right? Um, around the time that, that we kicked things off, um, you know, we're coming out of 2020 
and there's the huge George Floyd protests, BLM protests. And from my perspective, you know, I'm thinking a lot about my place in the world, how my music fits into world into the world. And I'm also seeing sort of like the the world of classical music sort of get like a wake up call in a way. Um, a lot of people are like Han saying, starting to try and look at their curriculums and um, you know see what is missing. And from my perspective, um, you know, there weren't many composers of my background that were included in curriculums. So as a student, I was searching for more. And as I, you know, talked to people and learned more about amazing composers, um, for example, Julia Perry is like um, a composer I had discovered around that time um, that I um, heard of through my teacher, Baljinder Sekhan. And I was like, this music's amazing, but no one's really talking about it. It's not really getting put out there. Um, so when we started on Lost to Time, it really became sort of like, um, us discovering composers we haven't heard before, getting really excited about them and really trying to get that out there. And that's kind of all tied into the idea of lost the time. There's, you know, all these great composers who we were amazed by who seem to be lost the time. And then, of course, you know, in the context of that 2020, 2021 time, it's um, also talking about how people alive today how their art and their their music can get lost to time. So kind of, you know, just we're learning as composers throughout doing the show and we want to sort of do what we can to, you know, share that music and get it out there. And also to point out, hey, this existed. It was really great, um, but it seemed to fizzle out in a way. Great. Yeah, that's oh, certainly uh a really eye-opening experience uh, to me and as a performer that I'm aware of, I'm aware of this problem um, that uh, very often the traditional programs don't have diversity um, uh, in terms of the nationality and the uh, cultural backgrounds of the composers uh, that we played. Um, and it has not, changed uh, for such a long time um, so this was really great um, and again thank you for starting this uh, of course somebody has to start this so um, my next question is uh, how did you uh, choose composers for each episode and um have you ever fight over composers <laughs> you <two? laughs> yeah um our our process for finding composers is really interesting i like to say you know by definition we're looking for composers who are sort of already hard to find so um it's really uh helpful for us when people might recommend a composer or you know, point out databases where we could find composers, things like that, because by definition, it's it's harder to find these composers on something like YouTube or, or you know, um, SoundCloud, Spotify, anything like that. Um, so it was kind of a mix. Sometimes we would just, um, you know, be digging through databases. We find a composer that whose music really resonated with us. Other times it would actually be I would tell people about the podcast and they'd say, hey, there's this composer, I think you know, no one's talking about, they're really amazing. Or sometimes it even be, you know, from professors um, or whoever we're studying with where they might point out a composer. So really free form. And of course, you know, we got recommendations from you and from other camp members before as well. Um, but I think, you know, Han, you might have even had a different process because you've definitely told me of some of the composers we've um, covered. Yeah, absolutely. I think a bit of our process would come from as we learned about these other composers, we would say, now, hold on, it would be a really cool idea to do an episode on, say, Galinos Vilskaya or other composers that we ended up doing episodes on. And then there were similar situations, of course, where we would learn about a composer or a few composers. And it would be a situation where, wow, we would really love to do an episode on them. But maybe it's a situation where maybe we're worried that they're too well known to 
get in, but usually we didn't worry about that. And usually that wasn't the case. Sometimes it might be a situation though, where there's just not enough of their music or not enough information, unfortunately for us to do a um, almost one hour, 40 minute situation um, episode. That's the word I was looking for (laughs) Um, on this person. And it's a thing where we really loved um, doing the research and putting in the work because not only would we learn even more about these composers as we were discovering them, um, but it was really great to share our findings with other people and through our episodes. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And something I would like to mention is I had a lot of, um, I don't want to say bias, but I had a lot of leaning towards um, doing composers from gender marginalized backgrounds because I spent last summer um, doing a research internship with the Boulanger Initiative. And I was working on their um, database of composers, which is now released. If you go on Boulanger Initiative's website, you can find it. And on there is a database of Uh, gender marginalized composers throughout history. So there's no living composers in there. And through this work, I was exposed to a lot, a lot of women and other gender marginalized composers of mostly the 20th and 19th century, but even before that. And I thought it was really um, fascinating to learn about all these composers from all around the world. And even still today, I'm learning a lot. So yeah. Shout out to Boulanger Initiative. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think, I guess if I can add something else to that. Please. Um, another aspect of finding the composers, um, I think, also came from sometimes the pieces we played. Um, so sometimes we might be playing pieces from composers who um, you know we might not have seen on our stand before. Another aspect is just when you start researching these composers, it's like a web. You know, you might have seen people do like their composer heritage or whatnot. Like, oh, if you trace my teachers far enough back, you get to like Beethoven or something. Well, in the 20th century, particularly, um, and I guess you know, even in other eras, um, these composers, you know, like they hang out with each other. They get into <laughs> they they have their own drama and stuff like that. And if you start, you know, looking at how they all connect, you eventually get to bigger name composers, too. And so it's kind of like there's this really organic, like, you know, time and place that a lot of these composers existed in. And if you start digging into how all the composers fit together in that time, you start finding a lot of composers you might not have listened to. Uh, For example, Julius Eastman, you know, there's a whole bunch of (laughs) anecdotes about Julius Eastman and his life in in New York and whatnot, um, that that was super interesting. And, you know, of course, that connects to composers like John Cage and whatnot. Absolutely. It's so interesting. Um, did you have um, any particular composers uh, or episodes that um, you still remember um, or hard to forget? I think, I mean, I just mentioned Julius Eastman. Julius Eastman's a big one, especially because we're around so many percussionists nowadays. So, mm-hmm. you know, we talk a lot about Julius Eastman. Um, Julia Perry's kind of like the the kickstarter to all of this where, you know, we had heard her works and those really stood out to us. So those, those pieces really um, connect with me still. And I think of, of those a lot. Um, so I think those two really stand out to me. Um, Galina Uswaskaja's music was also just really amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, so and also was kind of like a whole new aspect of our research of like the biography of a composer and how composers can, you know, influence how they're presented to the world. And also there can be that sort of disconnect. And um, there's so much to dig into with her biography. So that's one that really stood out to me. So I think I like, you know, a bit of drama in, in the composers. <laughs> I also, you know, the, their music really stands out to me. Yeah. I mean, for me, definitely those three, Josh, you definitely couldn't have said it better or on my mind a lot. Also, our Scott Joplin episode, very much so, especially lately, I've been meeting a lot of um, other master students in my year level. And a lot of them are really interested in RAG and in Scott Joplin and wanting to do more research on him. 
And it was really cool because I had done some research, obviously, on Scott Joplin at that point for our episode. So it was a cool experience of being able to offer those resources and say, hey, this is a place to start um, if you were interested sort of situation. And it was great to kind of reconnect on that composer through the research we had already done and through that knowledge that we gained by doing the episode and by meeting other people who are already interested in this composer. Yeah, that was a good episode. <laughs> yeah, so that just doesn't stop at the research or at the composer. It's just everything keeps um, continuing, which is great. Um, well, you mentioned about uh, uh, the research part to prepare the ep- episode um, a little bit. So maybe uh, you guys can uh, talk about you know how your preparations went for um, uh, each episode. That will be really helpful. Yeah, Josh, how about you? You hop on this one. Yeah, sure. Um, so interestingly enough, our preparations. I think we're really influenced by us doing our master's studies at Penn State at the time. Um, So we were, you know, getting into all of the the big databases and stuff and um, using things like Grove Music and, you know, other other sort of like catalogs with articles and journals and such. So we, we really did take an academic approach. We wanted to try and see um, well, first, we wanted really sort of credible sources, but also we wanted to see, are these composers being covered in an academic space? And there were definitely instances where it was like, oh, there's not much scholarly research on this composer. And sometimes, you know, that can be really telling. So that doesn't mean we we just, you know, avoided other sources. There are also some composers would be uh, would have a, a website of their own. Like Galina Uswaskaya has a website and you can sort of look at some of the the information on her catalog. Um, so there's kind of a mix of using scholarly research and then also looking at composers' websites, digging up uh, maybe if they're part of a, a database that made like sort of like a biographical entry for them. So I think those were, those were really um, big aspects. So it was like trying to do justice to the research side and also trying to acknowledge, like, hey, maybe these composers aren't covered as much. Um, and, of course, we would listen to a lot of their music as well and sort of start with trying to tie their biography into the music and seeing how everything connected. And then also trying to get a bigger view of, like, well, where are they now? You know, are there any statistics on their pieces, um, performance today? Or can we find any festivals that are including their music or festivals for them, things like that. Yeah, just to piggyback off of what Josh just said, um, the the course that Josh was mentioning, there's a research course that all music uh, master students are required to take their first semester here at Penn State. Um, and I don't know if the professor regularly changes, but when we when each of us took it, it was taught by Chuck Yeomans and he taught a lot about how to use these online databases such as Grove, WorldCat, um, our local library even. Um, I learned how to use WorldCat during my research internship with Boulanger Initiative. And of course, now that their database is out, that is now accessible to the public. Um, That is also a very valuable resource that we would look to when we could, when appropriate. Um, And everything else Josh kind of said very well. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's important because, I mean, sometimes you'll look up a composer and if you're just on Wikipedia or something, you'll get a wildly different account than maybe what's in like an article where someone's really dug into the biography. And especially in cases of like any sort of drama in the composer's life or controversy, you know, we wanted to check many sources. We wanted to see, well, we don't want to say the wrong thing. We also want to see, you know, what what the tea was, what's going on here, things like that. So um, kind of just combining a lot of um, resources that we had available and, you know, really trying to do justice to the composers. Um, and, of course, trying to adapt that into, you know, something that that, you know, people can really follow of connecting with the life of the composer as a person 
and then connecting with their music as well. Great. Yeah. Thank you for um, um, the, the insights and sharing, you know, the whole process. What do you think uh, the takeaways from, you know, this particular podcast series uh, for, you know, any audience who uh, does not know um, about this type of music or, or composers or what could they expect from um, this series? Yeah, I would say um, I think the biggest mindset here is never stop wanting to learn about new things, new music, new composers, whether it be new styles of music or composers from other practices, other cultures, other backgrounds. Um, always, you know, be open and eager to learn about these things. If you're that kind of person and you always are excited to learn about a new composer or a new style of music or anything like that, then this is this is your podcast, <laughs> I think. And we definitely like to think that Um, just generally, um, once if you've watched every single episode of this podcast and you're like, oh no, there's no more to watch. Well, it doesn't mean that there's no more composers to go out there and look for, um, and, and discover. I mean, there's ones that audience members will discover that Josh and I might not be aware of. Um, and that's completely, I mean, that's the way the world is. And it's really wonderful to learn about, um, these hidden gems who, uh, no pun intended, we're lost to time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think you really nailed it, Han. Um, another thing I'll say is just it's hard to put into words how big the world of music is. And what we're doing is really just trying to zoom in on a few instances of music that really was amazing that isn't being covered anymore. And This is, I think, something that anyone can do, you know, just finding new music and exploring it. Um, you know, this might be a, a weird, um, weird comparison, but I remember when I, I took U.S. history classes, you know, as an American, and then I moved to Canada. I've, I had uh, citizenship there for a while, and I studied Canadian history, and it's like, you know, there's, there's different histories in every culture in the world, right? In the same way, there's different music. And a lot of the time as we grow up, we're, we're only shown a certain perspective of the music world. And as soon as you broaden your horizons and look for more, um, you're going to find so many things you really like, you gravitate to, and you can't believe people aren't listening to. And this podcast is really just, you know, scratching the surface of that. And we hope it just empowers people to, you know, find more music. Yeah. Well, um, it's again that I'm very sad <laughs> that we have to say bye to uh, the series. But um, we have the last episode um, coming up. So um, maybe you guys can give us a tiny hint <laughs> about sure. what, where you may um, talk about. Absolutely. So... I'll, I'll give the hint first. Um, so just in one sentence, this is a composer who has perhaps pioneered electroacoustic music in Colombia. Now we think of a lot of different pioneers of electric, electronic, electroacoustic music. Um, but this is one who is a Latin American composer who I have not heard of until very recently. Um, Should we do the name drop or should we save that? For yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> yeah, um, this is Jacqueline Nova, um, Colombian composer um, of Belgian origin. And yeah, it's as Han says, um, this composer is really great, is said to have like, you know, pioneered um, electroacoustic music in Colombia. Um, but also it's just a classic example of, oh, I don't know this composer. Let me go listen to their music. And the music blows you away. So I think there's a lot to talk about with this composer. The music that she made, where she studied, who she studied with, um, you know, what contributions she made to the world of music. Um, it's all there. And um, it's another example of, you know, a composer who has been doing really amazing things that, you know, we should remember. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are so many composers we 
really should have known better and remember and performed and studied. Um, That's so, the name yeah. of the game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another it's, cool thing yeah. about um, Jacqueline Nova, which correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, I believe she's the first and I guess the only composer that we're doing an episode on who primarily works in the sphere of electroacoustic music. Um, I believe most of the composers we've done either did not write any electronic music, or if they did, it was like maybe a handful of works, but that wasn't their predominant um, style. Yeah, I think you're correct. Um, Maybe, I don't think that we've done many composers of electroacoustic music. Um, In my mind, I feel like we've done a Pauline Oliveros episode. (laughs) If not, that would have been a really great one. Um, I think she was a contender. Yeah, I think at one point we were seriously like, oh, should we do Pauline Oliveros? But I think um, at the time we were like, you know, Pauline Oliveros is, is, you know, getting a lot of respect. I think Pauline Oliveros deserves a lot more, but I think we went with a different composer at the time. But I think this will be our first composer who's like mainly in that electroacoustic space. I think you're correct. Yeah, so that'll be real exciting. It sounds very exciting really looking forward to um yeah well um let's talk about you guys <laughs> um and you know um it also it was so nice to hear your this you know really conversational um show and very friendly um uh really i felt always like i uh, you know with friends and with um maybe at a like dinner table or over even coffee and we're just casually talking about music and composers so i'm sure our listeners would love to know about you and your uh plan so yeah if you can share you know if you have any upcoming projects or your uh, near future plans uh please share that with us Sure. So for me, it's a bit more uh, straight line. I'm finishing up my master's. So that's going to be the biggest thing, working on that master's paper, getting that degree. (laughs) (laughs) Um, A year from now, I will be a master in. um, Then we'll see what the future holds from there. Um, In terms of actual works, I'm finishing up a art song right now that uses text by Walt Whitman. And I was approached by a vocalist friend of mine who wants to do a recital um, that embodies both his experience as a gay man as well as his experience as a religious man. And he wants to kind of juxtapose those two identities together. And so he asked me if I could write him a piece because I'm also a gay man. So that's been really fun to work on. Um, And yeah. Also, I just launched my new website, very easy to say now, pawnhitchin.com. Yeah. yeah, reach out to me. Look at my stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great, Han. Um, so, yeah, we've both been at Penn State together. I just finished my master's, uh, master's of music. But, you know, I don't feel like I mastered music yet, which I think is a great thing. So I'm trying to really explore the world. Um, my next year, I'm planning to really travel a lot meet a lot of people. Um, I've been super fortunate that uh, basically during my time um, studying classical music, I've had like, you know, a double career uh, as a classical composer and as a composer for uh, video games. So I have, um, you know, really, really successful um, career in that that field. So I'm continuing my work in game audio, um, doing music, doing sound design. And I'm also uh, continuing in classical music as well. Um, At least in the fall, I'll be having an orchestra premiere with the um, Penn State Orchestra. Um, So that's been really great. Um, And otherwise, I'll be going to Austin, Texas for the next year or so to, um, you know, kind of access the hub there and also be working with Blip Sounds, the company that I've been working with for a really long time in the game audio space. So. The world's kind of like an open book t- for me, um, but I've, I'm kind of in a really good position to explore things and 
and have a lot of fun making music, which I think is wonderful. Great. Yeah. Very excited for you guys. Um, um, we're we're going to listen to, uh, you know, your, your music um, at the end. Um, before we do that, I think um, um, if, you know, if you have any, um, anything, any other things that you want to add or um, uh, any things that we have not talked about uh, here, please. Sure. Um, could I give a little insight onto the piece that I selected for this? Uh, sure. I was going to ask that actually after this. Oh, you were? Okay, then I'll save that for that question. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe if there's if there's a, a really positive thing to add is, you know, I really loved what we what we did on Lost to Time. And I really think this is something that, you know, any any musician can really have an impact on. You know, the music you play has an impact. You know, when you're doing a recital, there's going to be other people out there at re recital who might say, oh, I want to play this on mine as well. So, you know, if there's a composer who you, you, you really like, um, who might be, you know, of a marginalized background, playing their music is one of the biggest things you can do. Um, and oftentimes, a lot of them don't have music that's, you know, super difficult to play. There's a lot of examples of composers who have works that you can, you know, put on a student recital. And if you're a professional, of course, you can, <laughs> you could probably play these. But um, yeah, I just, I think that's, that's a big thing, you know, just curate your ears, listen to a ton of music, but also, you know, if you have the chance to play these pieces, I think that's, that's one of the biggest difference you can make. Yes. Yes. Performers, <laughs> please program this music. Yes. Piggybacking a little bit off of Josh, um, even as a listener, um, if you're really into a composer who is someone who maybe has been talked about a lot in curriculums, you know, the Mozarts, the Beethovens, the John Cages of, um, of I guess, music education, for lack of a better word, Western classical music curriculum, um, there's lots of other composers who you've probably never heard of who have done work about as remarkable as these composers that you're frequently looking at the scores of hearing in concert halls and always, you know, be interested and be curious, stay curious and wonder, you know, who are these composers? What kind of music did they write? And ask yourself maybe why were they not given the time given the recognition that their peers were and always be aware of these things and always be interested in learning new things and be open to learning new things um even outside of music i think that's um nowadays more important than anything excellent yeah well um i think we can um wrap up this uh conversation and uh, we, I personally always like to um, have music uh, in the show. So um, we are going to play um, a piece by you guys, uh, Fog uh, by Han Hitchin. Um, it, it's uh, uh, recorded by the Penn State Philharmonic Orchestra and conducted by Tomas Garcia Duenas. Um, and then we will listen to State Machine by Joshua Mallard. Um, and it's recorded by the Mivas Quartet. So um, if you guys can, you know, talk about these pieces uh, before, we, um, before we finish this show, that would be really great. Sure. Of course, um, yeah. Oh. How about you kick it off? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, so Fog is actually an older piece of mine. I composed it, I believe I started it in the spring of my junior year of my undergrad and finished orchestrating it and getting it ready by the end of fall um, of my senior year, my last year. And I'm pretty sure that that was all during um, the COVID lockdowns and such. And that was a really... Um, difficult time to write an orchestra piece. I'm going to be totally honest. Um, 
And it was so, it was such a stressful time, a, such an uncertain time for everyone. I'm sure everyone can relate and understand um, that I was really struggling with um, kind of this idea of brain fog, where um, what brain fog is, is it's a set of symptoms that affect a person's ability to stay focused. Um, it can cause um, issues with like short term memory and confusion and things like that. And there's a lot of different sources for it. I recommend reading up on it. Um, I'm sure there's other resources that can explain it better than I can. But I titled the piece Fog One to recognize that experience that I went through while writing this piece. But also because there is a point in the piece where I just forgot how to how I composed it. <laughs> I made a whole system for the piece and I figured out how to how I did it later on um, when Tomas, the conductor, actually approached me and said, hey, how did you write this? I'm really interested. And he was doing a little bit of analysis himself. And I was like, uh, I don't know. Let me see if I could dig up my old notes and figure it out. And then I relearned my relearned how I wrote the piece. Um, so. That was a really interesting experience um, that I wanted to title the piece after. Um, in terms of actually how I composed the piece, it's a whole thing. I'm not going to get too much into it, but some of my influences for the orchestration. Um, I was listening to a bit of Mahler at the time because when I was composing this piece, um, I was taking comp courses, composition classes Excuse me, um, with my peers, Josh Mallard and um, Benjamin Kohler, us three were in there. And Benjamin Whiting was actually teaching the course. And he's anyone who knows him knows he's a huge Mahler buff. So I was listening to a bit of Mahler. Um, I was also listening to some Stravinsky and Varese as well in there um, in terms of orchestration influences and just a bit of my own stuff that I liked. But yeah, it was a really fun piece to write. Um, it was really fun working with Tomas and the Penn State Orchestra on that. Um, and fun fact, Tomas, I just had some new headshots taken and Tomas is not only a very talented conductor, he's also a talented composer, but also a talented photographer because he took my headshots and oh my gosh, I'm really happy with them. So we love Tomas in this household. <laughs> wow. A lot of talents. Yes. Multi-talented <laughs> Renaissance man. <laughs> yeah, that was a great premiere, Han. It was, thank you. And they're going to be premiering your piece soon, not State Machine, but another your orchestra work. And I'm really excited to hear that for you. Yeah, same here. <laughs> yeah, for um for State Machine, so this is a string quartet, and it's called State Machine uh, because each movement, each miniature, explores a different state of matter. So you have solid, liquid, gas, and then plasma. Um, this was really inspired by Andrew Norman's uh, Companion Guide to Rome, where um, Andrew Norman is exploring a lot of the different architecture around Rome. Um, in my case, I wanted to create a set of like really different miniatures that explore these different states of matter. Um, and so, for example, you have like the solid movement, which is like powerful. It's this like Bartok influence, really heavy uh, string playing. But then the liquid movement is, you know, this really sort of free flowing um, sort of like uh, like wave motion of the strings. And then they gradually drift apart and start to, um, you know, deviate in pitch and rhythm and evaporate into the gas movement. And then the gas movement um, is completely graphically notated and very free form. And then plasma, which I had to do a lot of research on because I had no idea <laughs> what it was when I went to make the piece. You know, it's these electrically charged particles. So the piece has this really wild, chaotic energy. And each of these movements is very short and um, they're miniatures, but there's a lot packed into them. And I, I can't say, um, you know, how wonderful it was to get to work with Mivo's Quartet. This was a result of a reading they did at Penn State, but it was so amazing. They really nailed the piece. Um, so that's State Machine. And maybe a fun fact, the name comes from my work in game audio, a State Machine being a part of game engines that lets you cycle between different, you know, states of uh, character or animation. Thank you so much. Um, and 
Um, Josh and Han, thank you so much for all of your work on Lost Time. It was um, it was such a great series, and I'm very thankful um, in behalf of Camp um, to have this series. And best luck with your future. Thank you so much thank for having so- us. And <laughs> you go ahead, Odd. I was literally going to say the exact same thing. Thank you. It was our it was our pleasure. Yeah, we had a really great time and, you know, we grew a lot throughout the series. So um, we learned a lot and we're just really glad to, you know, be able to do something um, for, you know, the music out there. Thank you very much. Um, and here is Fog by Han Hitchin. And after that, um, we have State Machine by Joshua Mallard.
Support us by donating. You can go to our website, www.contemporaryartmusicproject.org, and simply click the donate button. Help us continue our podcast, festival, and other exciting projects. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time with more music. <laughs>